Do SEOs miss Matt Cuts? Yahoo Maps is shutting down. And last night, I was periscoped. Welcome to This Week in Organic, episode number two. This Week's Inorganic. Live from London on thisweekinorganic.com. Broadcasting live from London, welcome to This Week in Organic, the weekly show that debates the ramifications of the latest SEO and content marketing news. Sign up to watch the next show live at thisweekinorganic.com. Hello and welcome. I'm David Bain and each week I'll be joined by some knowledgeable, opinionated folks to discuss the latest happenings in anything that impacts organic traffic. And as far as you, dear viewer, get involved. We'd love to hear your opinion too. So just use the hashtag Twio on Twitter, that's T-W-I-O, if you're watching live. Uh, your thoughts will magically appear in the chat box to my left-hand side. Um, so uh, we've got some great guests joining me today. Uh, one of them is just about uh, to join us, hopefully in a couple of minutes. But let's uh, say hello to the first three. So it's starting off with Kelvin. Hello, everybody. Yeah, hi. Um, my name's Kelvin Newman. Um, I, as is the way nowadays, um, wear a few different hats, um, but perhaps best known for organizing um, the Brighton SEO conference, the biggest um, SEO gathering of digital marketers in the UK, um, and also host the Internet Marketing Podcast, which has been going for about 290 episodes, um, talking away um, about all things internet marketing. Very exciting. Episode 300 coming up soon. Uh, yeah, it's um, very, very soon. <laughs> superb. Um, so what has caught your eye over the last week in terms of SEO and content marketing stories? Um, well, I mean, I think with... There's this constant shift, this constant change that's been going on um, in the the world of content marketing. I think there's some real big trends, and some of the things that you you alluded to um, that we're going to be talking about today, I think, are, are certainly a big part of that. And I think that there's the the continual rise of this kind of video streaming, the periscope, the meerkats, is perhaps not the biggest thing over the last week or so, but certainly I think it's one that is setting up to be quite a big deal in the world of digital marketing. Okay, great stuff. Okay, let's say hello to Matt. Hi there, David. Uh, Matt Hodkinson from Influence Agents. We're an inbound agency based in London. Um, so we're helping with not only SEO and organic, but also with content marketing. Uh, I'm also a regular on BBC Five Live's The Big Share on Afternoon Edition, which can tune in and catch every Thursday. Um, so I've been, um, I'm a periscoper, I have to admit, uh, that's a big admission. And um, it has actually, there's, it's been a big news week for Periscope because they had a new update yesterday, so I'm quite looking forward to talking about that uh, today. I'm a periscope I think of being a periscoper is better, but <laughs> let's hello, hello to Paul. Hi, my name is Paul, I'm a conversion expert from Promoto Company. And I'm also founder of the Mage Cloud, uh, the platform that helps to build e-commerce business in a couple of minutes. Uh, my passion is A-B testing, conversion rate optimization, and speak at multiple different conferences in the U.S. So this week, uh, I was really impressed with a few things uh, that is probably less related to ACO, but more for the online marketing. So number one is definitely shutdown of the uh, Yahoo Maps. And also, the previous week when Google announced that they will push the live offline uh, local maps. And another point that I want to recognize for local businesses is that uh, the Yelp announced that they go to launch e-commerce functionality within their own platform. So those two things that is kind of connected to what I'm doing is, is something that I want to discuss today. Sure, okay. And... Um... Last but not least, um, we have him with us. Um, it's Mr. Stuart Rogers. Stuart, hi. Hey, David. How are you doing? And uh, hi to everyone. Um, it is great to be here. Well, yeah, wonderful for you to join me. Would you like to um, start off by saying a little bit about um, where you're from and perhaps what's caught your eye over the last seven days in terms of um, content marketing and, and related subjects? Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm Director of Marketing Technology at VB Insight, which is VentureBeat's research platform. And uh, so I, I sometimes sit on the venture beat news side of things and write stories about marketing technology. And on the other side, I'm one of the analysts that is looking at the entire marketing technology space. Um, so that's that's currently around 2,400 products on my radar in uh, 29 different categories. So uh, keeps me keeps me kind of focused and interesting. Sometimes the uh, the little board on the right hand side you can't see gets a little bit like 
that uh, beautiful mind movie. Wow, well, hopefully you've got uh, someone helping you out there. That sounds a bit scary. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got lots of awesome analysts at uh, VB Insight. And um, yeah, we're, we're doing some really interesting stuff with, with the whole marketing technology space right now. Wonderful. Okay, um, well... <laughs> in terms of this week, um, just to answer your question, yeah. um, there's been a lot of interesting stuff this week. Obviously, the, the unbundling of photos from Google+. Plus. I know we're going to talk a little bit about Google+, Plus today and whether it's, it's dead or not. Um, I spent the early part of this week... Uh, not in sunny Kent down in England, but over in Boston uh, because we had Growth Beat Summit, um, which uh, I was uh, very honoured to MC. And uh, over at Growth Beat Summit, um, we had what 180 of the of the top CMOs in the room. Um, we also then therefore got an opportunity to have a chat with them about some of the things that are happening in the space, and uh, also talk to the editor in chief at uh, AdventureBeat about Google Plus and about what's happening there. Uh, that's Dylan Tweeney. And, um, yeah, he and I disagree on it, so uh, it'll it'll be interesting. I'll be able to bring you both points of view because I, I was able to grab his point of view and bring it back with me for you. So, so many great topics suggested there. Um, I think we're going to be here for the next six hours, so I'm, I'm glad um, someone's brought the bananas. That's good. <laughs> um, well, let's start off with a question that's on everyone's lips today. Will Andy Murray beat Novak Djokovic? <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> well, okay. Um, let's start I'll, off. I'll give you a data-driven answer is uh, it would suggest no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at SMX Advanced on Tuesday, uh, Danny Sullivan shared a video um, about um, Matt cuts through the years. Um, so he's probably on his way out in terms of head spam. Um, with Google. Um, he has obviously been the face of Google and um, um, communicated with lots of webmasters over the last few years. Um, is that going to be a loss for Google or do you think Matt Cutts is still going to be around or are Google slowly morphing into just using lots of people as their face to webmasters and SEOs? Um, Kelvin perhaps, have you got any thoughts about that at all? Yeah, I mean I think it's certainly a... it's going to be challenging for Google um, to be able to communicate um, some of the sometimes quite complex um, arguments and changes that, that are occurring. Um, and Matt Cutts, for all that people do criticise him, is a very good communicator. He has built this reputation up over a large number of years where he's really been this kind of calm, um, friendly face of what is essentially a large, huge team of people working on very complex problems and solving them in complex ways. Um, so it's going to be hard for them to find someone to replace that, but I do think it is certainly a sensible approach um, that they you know, distribute that across their team and have areas and individuals of, of specialism. Um, I don't envy the role that he's had to play um, for them as an organisation over the last you know, couple of you know, dozen years. Um, and you know, it doesn't surprise me that it you know might be something that he wouldn't want to do forever. Um, so you know, it's I can see the logic from his perspective. I can see the logic from Google's perspective. But certainly, I think it's going to be a, a, a hard pair of shoes to fill, and it's going to take quite a few people to do that. I would see. Yeah, it'll certainly be interesting to see what happens over the next um, couple of years or even the next few months or so. Um, they have obviously had some people from Google Switzerland um, appearing on different webinars and, um, and and helping out. But as you say, it's a big pair of shoes to actually fill there as well. Um, Google, um, I think all SEOs um, have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with Google because um, they can offer such great value and, and, and a lot of traffic, obviously, to uh, people's websites. Um, but um, they're not necessarily the best communicators all the time in the world, and um, they don't necessarily make technology that um, is understood by um, the, the general public, possibly. Um, so... Um, I guess watch the space to see what happens. Uh, but but there are lots of different things happening with Google at the moment. Um, there's there's talk of another Panda update happening within the next um, three or four weeks at all. Um, so, but Panda, of course, is um, at the moment uh, a bit of a manual refresh um, rather than anything that's automated within their algorithm. Um, so um, does anyone have any thoughts on whether or not Panda is likely to be continue to be a bit of a manual input? into Google's algorithm, or is this something that they might be able to automate at some point in the future? 
I, I, I'll jump in there. I don't think it's uh, ever going to be something that will be fully automated. I don't think it needs to be in the uh, in the hands of Google 100% or, or any other search engine or, or professional body. I think it's um, it's going to become a, a user moderated thing. I think it should continue to reflect people's reactions uh, to particular pieces of I think that uh, people's kind of levels of engagement and those triggers and indicators as to people's engagement with particular pieces of content should always be the biggest driver as to uh, you know what's what's most important and um, and the relevance when when people are searching out this information. So I, I think it's going to go that way. It will never be fully automated, but the the, the power will be with the people. Mm. Stuart, do you have um, a, a like for black and white little creatures? <laughs> um. Yeah, you know, SEO is an interesting thing, and it's an interesting thing from Google's perspective. Uh, I remember when Matt first went on leave, um, I remember a lot of the comments. A lot of them were ill-informed comments because, you know, everybody just assumed that since Matt's going on leave, they can now start spamming everybody, and that's obviously not what's going to happen. Um, it's as if they think that Google is, is maybe just three or four people still, um, and it's been a very long time since it's just been three or four people. Uh, so, you know, I think... In terms of Google's interest in SEO, um, you know, some people have very strong opinions on that. Some people think that since Google has AdWords and AdWords makes money for Google, that Google have waged some kind of ridiculous, uh, you know, campaign against SEO companies um, because, of course, it's in their financial interest to do so. Um, I don't necessarily buy that. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's the case. Um, they might have an, an overarching strategy, of course, to, to make money. Um, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the recent infographic that shows you how much money Google makes per second across the world, but it is really quite an obscene amount of money. I can't believe that um, waging a mild war against SEO companies is going to uh, make a massive dent in that. Um, you know, I think they're doing quite well enough uh, as they are. Um, I think there's much, much bigger things than this, and you know, Google, for me, tend to get it reasonably right as a user. Um, if I do a search for something, I invariably find it, and I invariably find it in more and more useful and interesting ways, um, such as you know, the, uh, the cards that came in, the, um, the way that Google Now is working now, and also how it will work in the future with Now on Tap. Um, all of this is useful to me as a user, and it provides a great deal of value for me, and it tends to be the right result for what I was looking for. Um, so I think from an SEO standpoint, they, they probably just don't need to put so much emphasis and effort into having a figurehead for that. Um, it is still a big part of, of the business, obviously. Um, but uh, that's that's what I think. You, you said a couple of things that, that interest me there, Stuart, actually. You said um, tends to be the, the right result and find what you're looking for. So that indicates that you're happy uh, as long as if Google can provide the right one result for you as opposed to giving you options. Do you, do you think that as a user, generally, um, that's what you want rather than actually being given a search engine results page with lots of different possibilities on it? It depends what I'm searching for. If I'm searching for an actor because I'm watching a movie and I want to know more about them, the last thing I want is 10 results. Um, all I really want is who's this actor, what have they been in. Um, I might want a choice of which app I look at that in, and that's what Google on Tap is going to give me. Um, so you know, if I want to go and have a look at their Rotten Tomatoes score, I'm clearly going to click on Flickster as opposed to clicking on IMDB, for example. Um, so... The choices that we make as consumers as, as we go forward with uh, contextual search solutions such as Google Now and Now on Tap, um, and of course all of the others have their own or are working on them, um, are going to be probably which app do you, would you like to read this information in as opposed to do you want to stay within the browser. Um, for more complex searches, then yes, I do want a selection of choices. and. Um, Whilst a sample set of one is not statistically significant, I generally tend to find that Google gives me better results than uh, the other uh, search engines that are out there. Okay, well that gives us a good segue into our next um, area of discussion, and that's Yahoo, because um, Yahoo have announced quite recently that they're actually putting an end to their Yahoo Maps service, and that's something that, Paul, you mentioned um, as part of your introduction, in, in introduction. So what are your thoughts, Paul, about that? Well, I'm personally not involved in the Yahoo Maps for years. 
I mean, I'm a Google guy. I'm I'm in love with Google Maps, and I think they did a much better job. You know, just uh, uh, keep people engaged, keep a Google business over there. Uh, I think that even the big companies get some uh, trouble with their products. Uh, the same happened with Google Voice and you know other bunch of the Google products. So from business perspective, looks like uh, it makes sense for them to shut down. Uh, I'm sure they will work on something new going forward. Has anyone else? Probably it was just not enough for other people. It was not really successful, and they see the you know the traffic goes down, the people interest is goes down, and so. Mm. I mean, you have to always improve your products, and besides, uh, like comparing uh, the the maps with Yahoo and Google, I'm always see that Google innovate the stuff. Even with the offline search, I mean, they're doing much better job. You know, especially with mobiles, uh, mobile devices. So yeah, that's. I, I think that's that's reasonable and makes sense. Total sales for the Yahoo co to concentrate on something else okay. where they good at. Okay, so it's not a sign of failure then. It's simply that they're they're refocusing on areas that are most important to them and hopefully going to be a more successful commercially successful business because of it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Interesting stuff. So um, has anyone on the panel actually, um, I call you panel, <laughs> uh, uh, has anyone um, actually used Yahoo Maps at any point in the last couple of years? I've, I've got to be honest, I'd kind of forgot that they even had that product, um, which is, you know, um, always uh, a little bit damning on that side of things. But it does seem a logical move. Um, I think for for Yahoo, their problem has always been um, too many things to think about. Um, but it does seem strange that in light of their particular focus on mobile, um, that, that location, uh, perhaps rather than maps, but location is so key to that, uh, it does seem perhaps a little bit of a strange play from that perspective. It does. Just when um, um, Apple are obviously moving significantly into uh, maps themselves, and um, um, have we seen a play on maps from Facebook at all? I'm not sure if we have or not. Well, Facebook tried to get into maps in a different way with the uh, the check-in product. And what was quite interesting about Facebook check-ins was that um, it massively increased Foursquare's user base um, very shortly after its launch. So I don't think they did a particularly good job on that. I mean, my, my worry with Yahoo is this is not just a singular thing. This is not just we're closing down Yahoo Maps. Um, you have to also take into context with the rest of the announcements they made. Um, Yahoo Pipes, which was effectively a predecessor to IF Treble T, mm. um, you know, that is also being canned. Um, they've killed off GeoPlanet and Place Spotter APIs. Um, they've killed off Yahoo Music in France and Canada, Yahoo Movies in Spain, and uh, got rid of the Philippines homepage. Um, Yahoo TV has gone from UK, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and Canada as well. Yahoo, Yahoo Autos has gone um, in certain local places. Um, Yahoo Entertainment is going to close in uh, in Singapore in July, and it's kind of weird because you know this company uh, was very very bullish about personalised content, um, and yet they're pulling back and pulling back and pulling back all the time. Um, and of course, don't forget they're also killing support for Yahoo Mail on the uh, on the built-in mail app for devices prior to iOS five. So. Um, and making some changes to the way contacts work, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, but you know, Yahoo did uh, close something like uh, I've got to think of the figure now. Emil Protoleski um, wrote about this. I think it's 60 products and services in the last two years to narrow the focus of the company. Um, now they say narrow the focus, but you know, there's lots of reasons why people might do that. One of them might be cost and resource. Um, there's other great reasons, which might be that Yahoo is going to launch something incredible and all-encompassing very soon that replaces all of these. Um, you know, I tend to think it's it's more of a cost and resource move at this point until they actually convince me otherwise. Yeah, and I, I, I 
I'd say that they've, they've realized perhaps that they're just so far behind their competitors on, on each of those kind of product verticals. You mentioned Facebook. The whole thing about checking was, of course, about fueling the, the graph search and then generating enough information to that, make that a worthwhile enterprise. I'm not sure whether they've achieved it. Um, but they're probably looking at the likes of Google, who are now looking at in-venue navigation as well as uh, just your, your, your average kind of, um, you know, your maps and your street view and, and everything else. So they've probably looked at the gap. They're looking at what it's going to take in terms of investment in development and, um, and money and just realize that uh, in several of those verticals, they're, they're never really going to catch up without a massive spend. Well, you've all said that um, you haven't used Yahoo Maps at any point, you know, certainly in the last couple of years at all. Um, let's um, broaden it a little bit and actually uh, conduct a quick straw poll here and actually say, uh, what was the last Yahoo product you used and how long ago was it? So um, um, do, do you want to say quickly, Colvin? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I use any Yahoo products with any kind of frequency. Uh, I don't know if that's largely because I'm in the Apple ecosystem, so... Therefore, you know, being Google and Apple, there's, is there the place for the third there? But certainly, I can't think of anything. Certainly not in the last, you know, at least six weeks, perhaps even three months. What about yourself, Matt? Uh, I think Yahoo Answers is probably the one that I've used on the most frequent basis, but even then, it's, um, it's, it's really not that frequent. Um, I'm struggling to think of anything else, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and what about Paul? My last uh, Yahoo product it was a Yahoo Messenger, probably like six years ago. Okay, wow. And Stuart? I have consumed some of my friends' photos on Flickr, um, and that's about it. Um, other than that, I haven't used anything from Yahoo in a, in a very very long time. That's incredible, yeah. I mean, I remember using a service called My Blog Log um, years ago, um, and they were bought by Yahoo, of course, um, and perhaps intermittently I've been forced to have to log into a Yahoo account to do something, but I certainly can't remember doing that in the, the last two years. So um, that, that maybe it's a very small, small poll, but it maybe tells the story there. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the demise of Yahoo Maps. Um, uh, another quick topic here. So let's move on to our top CMOs missing out and not being on Twitter. Because um, um, there was an article published fairly recently that uh, indicated that less than a third of top CMOs weren't on Twitter at all. Um, now, is this a big mistake on their part? Or is it um, quite reasonable that CMOs of really top companies probably shouldn't be interacting that much on Twitter and it, it doesn't necessarily indicate that they're not doing marketing correctly. Um, has anyone got any thoughts on that? I think it probably says more about Twitter than it does about the CMOs. Um, I think from that perspective, there's a real interesting challenge that we talk about, you know, Yahoo perhaps struggling there as well. I think Twitter, despite being very, very central to how I consume, you know, the internet, the web, um, digital, it's having a real struggle at the moment of attracting and retaining um, its users. Um, and I think it perhaps says more about um, Twitter's failure to convince these people that it's essential um, rather than necessarily a failure on the part of the, the CMOs, perhaps. And do you think that Twitter's um, agreement with Google and appearing higher, perhaps, in their mind besides search results might make it more likely for these types of people to be using Twitter in the future? Well, I think a big part of that play of um, Twitter re-allowing Google access to their tweets on the scale at which Google would want is about attracting people to Twitter who aren't logged in users, uh, people who they can then monetize. And there's so much content there, that seems like a very logical play. Um, that, you know, you could think about the sheer amount of content there, the variation in keywords that are there, that, you know, should lead to a huge amount of content being discovered via Google. Um, and I think perhaps is maybe testing the water for a, a closer relationship in the future. Certainly from some of the analysis that I've been reading, it seems to suggest that that might be, you know, a bit of a kind of let's see if we can actually genuinely work together. Okay, I'd like to go to Paul now, actually, because, Paul, um, you're very active as a conference speaker in the United States, uh, but you're not that active on Twitter. Um, do you not really enjoy interacting on Twitter? Um, or um, is that something that you're planning on doing a little bit more in the future? Okay, so I can tell you I'm quite active on Twitter as a brand. 
So me as a CMO of the specific company, I consume Twitter in a different way that I consume as uh, personality. So as a person, I'm looking into the Twitter as a you know news stream to get me quick updates about what's going on in the industry. But at the company, I do believe that CMOs they they just have to think of Twitter not as a distribution content platform, but mostly as a communication platform. So if you take a look at uh, let's say Mage Cloud, etc., the way how we interact with Twitter, we're trying to analyze the different conferences when we participate, and sometimes Twitter it's the very it's the easiest way for me to get to the company to get the introduction to the company they want to partner with, just by using that you know the hashtag or just tweet to the guys. So when I consume the Twitter, I'm I'm usually trying to search for the specific topic and then try to see what people are talking about that and just jump into the conversation. That's quite interesting, actually, because um, from what you're seeing there, you you are an active user of Twitter, but um, a lot of it is actually researching what's going on in your industry. So perhaps this um, survey that uh, that has um, been announced for, um, fairly recently about less than a third of um, CMOs actually being on Twitter, perhaps that's a little bit misleading. Maybe they are using Twitter, but they're using Twitter like that as a research tool rather than actually a tool to interact on and, um, and network. Uh, do you think that could be the case, Matt? Yeah, I, th I think so. But also, I think the um, the big issue with CMOs is that they realise they're they're quite a bit of a target. And I think uh, perhaps there's one one part of their brain is saying, look, I'm going to throw myself out to uh, to being contacted by all and sundry. Everybody wants to talk to the CMO at uh, large organisations for whatever reason. So maybe they just think that staying under the radar is um, is a big reason. But I, th I think a lot of them don't understand. Actually, um, sadly, the potential, you mentioned the, the integrations and the deals that they're doing with Google and the whole discoverability and the impact that Twitter and the other social networks have on ranking now um, just by its very nature. And, um, and perhaps it's just taken them a, a long while to catch up with, with what's actually going on in the industry. Is staying under the radar a good idea for CMOs, Stuart? Um, absolutely not. And... You know, but there's there has to be you have to sort of appreciate the difference between the CMO being on Twitter and the CMO's brand being on Twitter, and why you know the two might use them very differently. Um, so, for example, I, I, I did a, a report on social media marketing recently, and uh, we got some help from TechSifter's Discover Text technology, um, and with that we grabbed 250,000 tweets from 1,600 brands over the course of nine days to work out what these people actually did. Um, you know, my first thing that I found in that was that um, quite a lot of these brands don't actually tweet at all. So, you know, for 1,600 top brands, and in nine days, they didn't send out a single tweet. Um, the ones that did tweet a lot were people like American Airlines, um, who did 8,000 tweets over the course of nine days and Comcast and Royal Dutch Airlines and Chevrolet and the Independent and British Airways and United and you think hang on he's just listing airlines at this point point." Um, and it's true that the airlines really have managed to get it and they're the ones that are engaging with people about lost bags, late flights and all this sort of stuff. Um, they're actually doing an incredibly good job of it. Um, the vast majority however of the brands um, that are out there are actually just using Twitter as a broadcast channel um, especially, obviously, all of the uh, the news outlets, um, and there's no reason why that's a bad thing. They, you know, news outlets probably should use Twitter as a broadcast channel, um, but the CMOs are missing out. Um, I think a good example of a CMO that really gets it and understands, you know, what's going on, is uh, somebody like Mike Volpe of HubSpot. You know, he's uh, he's on Twitter. He uses it really well. Um, he uses it to understand what uh, his peers and other people are saying about his marketplace. He engages with people, he talks to people. Um, yes, he does a lot of broadcast, but he, he does a, a really good job on there. And uh, that's the kind of thing that a CMO can get up to on Twitter and all other social networks, apart from even just the sheer understanding of how these things work. I mean, you know, whenever a new social network comes about, um, I'm usually the first to jump on it just to figure out 
what it is, what it does, and, and, and how to use it. Um, and it's no different in CEOs, by the way. I, I remember a report from CEOs that suggested that hardly any of them are on there, so much so that when Satya Nadella um, went, uh, became the Microsoft CEO, his first tweet was, first commitment as CEO, I won't wait four years between tweets uh, as a direct dig between him and all of the other CEOs. I think C-level generally needs to just get on Twitter and understand what it is and engage with people because people are having conversations about you regardless of whether you're there or not. You might as well be there and control the conversation and have some engagement. Okay, well, coming up, um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about new social opportunities, so um, things like Periscope, and also whether or not Google Plus is dead. You're listening to This Week in Organic, live from London, on thisweekinorganic.com. But first of all... I would like to give a big shout out to Chagis Gandhi. Uh, Chagis is known as the WP Chef, and you can find him over at learnwpforfree.com. Uh, thanks for sharing this week in Organic with your followers, Tejas. If you'd like a shout out too, um, all you need to do is sign up to watch the next show live at thisweekinorganic.com and use our special social share links and make sure you have a mention next time. But let's move on to discussing other social opportunities. And in fact, let's start with um, Google+. Plus. Um, so um, a Google exec came out um, this week and said, no, Google+, Plus is not dead. Um, Who is actively using Google+, Plus at the moment? We all are, aren't we? This is Hangout. Well, there we go. Um, <laughs> is, it, is it going to be unplugged from the rest of Google+, Plus though, moving forward? Um, I, I think it's interesting that it's... It, it depends on how you define Google+. Plus. As a um, competitor to Twitter or Facebook, it, it hasn't been successful. Um, its problem's always been that it's been a number of very good products stitched together. Um, and I think that's kind of always been its challenge. And that, that unbundling might make sense. But you have to bear in mind that, you know, but part of Google+, Plus behind that, you know, Google sign-in is YouTube, which is the biggest you know, user-generated content platform out there. Um, and just because it isn't quite the same as Facebook, it isn't quite the same as um, Twitter, doesn't mean it should, it should be discounted. Okay, I'll, try and fr- I'll phrase my uh, question a slightly different way then. Um, um, who um, in the last week has interacted on a Google Plus profile or a Google Plus page? Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, so do you do that on a regular basis, Stuart? Every single day. Um, so... I use pretty much every element of Google+. Plus. Um, I have Google+, Plus communities that I manage, um, and I have uh, content that goes out on Google+. Plus. Um, because of the way that Google+, Plus works with the circles, I'm able to have a public profile on Google+, Plus where you see you know, all the things that I write and other people's analysis and, and reports and studies and news and all of those kind of things. And then, of course, um, I can put out messages that are just for a few eyes only by selecting the right circle. And, you know, I've always found that uh, particularly elegant um, in the way that they put it together. Uh, I wish the, the circle selection tools were better for deselecting circles once you've selected a lot of them. Um, it would be nice to, to be able to do that a little bit more. But, um, you know, I've always found that particularly good. Um, of course, you know, they, they just recently unbundled um, photos, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, effectively, Google Photos is an unbundling of the photos part of Google+. Plus. Um, available on web and you know all major mobile platforms, and uh, you know it's it's interesting I think um, looking at this whole issue of, of Google Plus losing parts of the uh, of of the uh, solution, so losing the notifications, um, so you won't uh, have Google Plus links across products um, like in Gmail for example. Uh, so that's that's one thing that's on the negative side, but at the same time. They've just launched collections, so you know it's. I think it would be foolish to sort of say that Google Plus is is dead at this point. Um, I think what is probably happening is that they are unbundling, in the same way that Messenger is unbundled from Facebook now, in the same way that Swarm is unbundled from Foursquare now. Um, I think they're going through an unbundling. I, go, I think they're going through a rebranding. Uh, you'll have noticed that Auto Awesome on Photos is now just Assistant, and. Uh, you know, starting to use just more plain English language. Um, and I think you'll find that going across the board. Um, you know, SMS messages on Android phones are probably, you know, by and large, actually handled by the Hangouts app now. 
and you know the Hangouts app is almost unbundled as is. Um, so I, I don't think uh, Google Plus is necessarily disappearing. I just think it's transforming and changing into the disparate set of apps that sits on maybe a somewhat social platform in the first place. Matt, are you a Google Pluser? I am. Uh, it's becoming more and more infrequent. I manage a community as well. Um, but I've got to say, in terms of sharing content, uh, from a personal perspective, it's um, it's become a bit of a, a rarity. Um, I'll just uh, follow up on what Stuart was saying. I think it can you can unbundle, um, and I think these things kind of go in trends. You know, they, we tend to go from unbundling to consolidation and back again, and these things go backwards and forwards. But I think the, the other thing to bear in mind is if you unbundle. Uh, so far, then you do kill the platform and it ceases to exist in its uh, in a usable format. I think the biggest thing about Plus uh, was they had a fantastic um, marketing effort in the in the early stages. Um, you know, the, the whole kind of exclusive and kind of limited invite only access um, with a very limited 150 invites to to each person um, was a genius piece of, of marketing that got them to 20 million users in the same time frame it took Twitter and Facebook three years um, it took them 28 days so it's um, yeah I think what's happened is they've, they've missed an opportunity there was no real key differentiator apart from hangouts uh, to Facebook. It has its parallels in, in every single aspect of functionality as far as I can make out. So I think they, uh, whatever's going on behind the scenes, are they working behind the scenes on Plus? Is it getting the attention it deserves? I don't know. Um, if not, I think that could be its killer. Mm. What about Paul? Are you using Google Plus yourself? I'm not using Google Plus myself, probably because uh, I'm not in the content marketing board. I'm not distributing too much content. Uh, and most of my clients, they're not really using the Google Plus, in my opinion. But I do know some folks that build a fund of, you know, uh, really great communities on the Google Plus, like two million users fans, which is even bigger than uh, they've got on other social networks. So I don't believe that Google Plus uh, died or something like that, but I think it's just the platform for the very specific brand and with the very specific uh, management and the execution approach, which is kind of different from Twitter or Facebook and the, the way how the other users consume the information. Mm. Well, um, I guess um, no one quite knows what's going to happen over the next um, year or so because um, um, they offer a lot of great services and um, it, 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 I'm sure um, the, the majority of them at least will exist um, in some format, but it'll just be intriguing to see how Google's social battle uh, will evolve over the next um, year or so. Um, but talking about social, um, last night I was conducting um, a, a podcast interview and um, I was periscoped. Um, that is, um, my interviewee um, took a periscope um, while we were actually setting up the, the video. Now, I remember back in February, um, Twitter bought this app called Periscope, which um, let you uh, broadcast um, live video from your device. And um, recently they've um, launched the app um, on Android just in the last week or so. Um, they had launched the app on um, the i store about um, two months ago or so. I haven't personally used it yet. Um, who, um, uh, if anyone has uh, a personal experience of actually using Periscope and, um, and how do you think that will impact marketing opportunities in the future? I have to jump in here, Dave, because I, I'm actually the organizer of London's Periscope Meetup. And so uh, we had our first meetup last month, and we had a good few periscopers there. And so uh, we've uh, and cheap plug here. We've got another one coming up on the 18th of June uh, in South London. Um, so we've got uh, we've got Mark Shaw speaking at that one. Now he is um, he's a really prolific periscope user. Um, I've been using it sporadically. Um, I think I've got something to the order of about 5,000 hearts at the moment, which uh, which is kind of neither here nor there, um, and a few followers. But what, what I really find about it is the, uh, is the opportunity that it comes with. I see this as the next iteration of blogging. And I think whatever, uh, whatever drives you to blog, be it you know, personal um, passions or you know, be it travel, be it personal fitness, be it cooking or food, um, or be it for business, I think there's this whole plethora of opportunity, much like a hangout, 
for reaching a new audience. And the fact that it's bolted onto Twitter um, means that the early stage distribution is, is kind of taken care of. Um, I don't think that it, it would exist um, you know, at this point in time uh, or even get onto people's radar without that kind of leverage. Uh, that it's achieved. There's a new update that was released yesterday. Uh, there's new features being released all the time. They've just released a map so you can kind of, uh, you know, really on a geolocation basis find out what's going on around you in terms of periscoping. And uh, there's all sorts of things, that, uh, new integrations with Twitter so you can, book, uh, you can share your own broadcast from, from within the app as well. So there's all sorts of things that are bringing on new users every day. It's growing all the time, and I think um, it just comes down to people identifying those opportunities and use cases for it. I can't believe I'm two months out of date here. I just don't know much about it at all. Uh, do, you, do you want to give uh, Matt? Um, do, you, do you want to give a brief summary of actually how it works and um, sure. perhaps, perhaps the, the the best ways of using it at the moment? Well, we could give a live demo here. I mean, this yeah. this is the app here. We've got a, a whole list of uh, broadcasts. These ones are, are kind of recorded and in my network, but I can literally go out to the to the world. Uh, pizza's not for breakfast. I mean, there's all there's all sorts of. You've got to take the rough with the smooth when it comes to Periscope. There's all sorts of stuff. Uh, there's some chap just talking away. On the left-hand side here, you'll see that people are uh, passing their comments. Uh, one of the recent features that they uh, released was that you can kind of tap on one of these and respond to someone's comment as well. So it's becoming conversational text-wise as well. And you'll see this stream of hearts uh, uh, going up the right-hand side, and that's effectively a like. And um, you know, some people get more hearts than others. Uh, there are people with literally tens of millions of hearts and, and who've become overnight celebrities. Um, despite them having a very, very mediocre following on, on Twitter. I mean, I've seen people who have got literally hundreds of thousands of followers on Periscope uh, who have, have like 1,500 followers on Twitter. So it's, it's not necessarily dependent on the kind of levels of reach that you traditionally had via other channels. People are literally making web celebrities of themselves on Periscope just for the, for the content they're sharing uh, on a regular basis. Wow, okay. And um, what perhaps are, are a couple of examples of, of, of good and bad practice um, uh, or in terms of um, a business using it? Do you think it's actually a business opportunity at the moment or is it simply just a way um, to engage with people online? Like, like much of content, I think a lot of it comes down to thought leadership and attaching yourself to, uh, to whatever your, your cause is. And in business, that means you know, showing your credibility, demonstrating your credibility and expertise on a particular topic. Uh, so we've got all sorts of opportunities, I think. You know, formats like this, where there's an interview format, panel format, um, opening up the floor to, to conversations with people in a particular sector. Uh, but also, you know, the whole t a TV show format where you can uh, get to talk about particular topics and showcase yourself in the same way that people have been doing via vlogging and, um, and hangouts and, and the like and recorded video. But now it's, um, it's much more kind of right here, right now and mobile experience as well. So talking about um, recorded video or live video, um, there might be something glitchy going on at the moment um, with um, the live experience inside This Week in Organic.com. I've uh, received a few tweets, um, Brian Cooper, um, a couple of other people saying that um, um, they're struggling to actually um, view it within there. So um, if you view, you can't view it in there and are viewing this um, as a recording, so apologies about that. Hopefully some people are being able to uh, view it live okay there as well. Um, but um, staying with Periscope, um, Stuart, is that something that you've tried? Yeah, I can't very well 20 minutes ago say when something new launches... I jump all over it and not having tried the Periscope and Meerkat and Stream and all of the others, um, of course, I've absolutely tried them out. Um, in fact, you know, hot off the press, um, I was in Boston earlier this week. We had Growth Beat Summit out there, and that was a room full of amazing people. I mean, it's, Growth Beat Summit is, is an invite-only audience, and it's, you know, CMOs and above, very high bar in terms of the people that were there. Um, you had the likes of Brian Kramer there. Uh, you, you had uh, Tamara McCleary there. Um, you know, both of, of those uh, people are very, very good at social, really understand it. Um, and whilst I've used Periscope, I've used Meerkat. Before Meerkat and Periscope launched on Android, um, there was another live streaming tool called Stream, and 
that for quite a long time was the only Android option that made any any kind of sense. Um, I'd recommend you know people who don't like Periscope or Meerkat taking a look at Stream because it's very smart, very nice. Um, but you know before uh, those, um, I didn't get an opportunity to to try it myself because I needed it to be on Android, um, given that I I don't like fruit based phones. And uh, you know I've I've tried it out. I like it. Um, I like the experience. Um, I've been able to use it for a kind of like a behind the scenes kind of gig, um, you know, where you're showing people the, uh, the, the, you know, the people coming backstage to uh, before they go out on the stage and all that good stuff. Um, but Tamara and Brian both uh, did Meerkat and Periscope from the audience, showing the sessions that were going on. So, you know, when you had people like Michael Williams, who is responsible for Grand Prix of America at Formula One. Um, you know, sitting there talking with with Brian Kramer, you had Tamara McCleary putting that out live on Periscope and Meerkat simultaneously with two different devices, and the amount of buzz that that generated online for the event and uh, everybody that couldn't get there and, and who wanted to see you know Michael Williams speak live was incredible. Um, it absolutely blew up, and mm-hmm. we ended up trending on on Twitter, um, which. You know, a lot of people say trending on Twitter, and then, you know, but it, um, what I mean by that is we trended on Twitter for all of Boston, and it was at the same time as quite a lot of pretty big news was hitting. So to to be on the top ten trends um, for all of Boston, and we didn't quite get into all of the United States, but uh, a large part of that was thanks to the the buzz that was generated from Periscope and, and Meerkat. So yeah, it does it does surprise me. I mean, our most recent conference, the Brighton SEO conference, um, was only a few weeks after um, South by Southwest. The amount of people who were watching streams of shaky footage of um, of the talks that are occurring did surprise me. Um, but if there's a demand for what people are sharing, then people will watch it. The problem is is that there isn't this, although it's built upon Twitter, um, if what you're trying to share isn't interesting, it isn't appropriate to the format, then you're going to struggle. It's all very easy for people who already have a big social profile um, to get people to watch a couple of minutes of video. Um, trying to, you know, as a brand, trying to promote your business, is there the audience there? That's a more tricky question because it can be a bit flaky. You know, it's just one of the, it's not the most, it's not an enterprise solution at the moment. And you're for some brands, you want that control. It's not, you know, not appropriate. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, oh, by the way, um, quick, uh, quick fanboy moment. Really love what you've done with Brighton SEO. So uh, okay. great job there. Um, but you know, I think my biggest issue with with live streaming at the moment. Um, I I looked into this a little while back before the likes of of Meerkat and Periscope. In fact, several years before mm-hmm. then. Um, and what I was looking at was a little hardware device called a Luxi, um, and it's spelt in a ridiculously strange way, so I'm not going to even attempt it. Um, but the Luxi was quite interesting because it looked like one of those beam, uh, sort of boom um, Bluetooth headsets. Right? It went in your ear, around your ear, and stuck out a little bit at the front, um, like the original Bluetooth headsets did. But the bit that's sticking out at the front is a camera, and it connects via Bluetooth to your phone, and any time you wanted to, you could capture and save the last 30 seconds of what you were looking at. So it was a way of, of capturing your your life in 30 second chunks. Um, and you know the thing is, is that when you're using Meerkat and Periscope, you've got to hold your phone. And uh, you might, if you're really, really lucky, um, you might have bought one of these uh, stupendously amazing tiny little pieces of equipment, um, which turns into da da a <laughs> tripod for you to put your phone into so that you've got a tripod with you in your pocket and it's no bigger than a key ring. So you might have bought one of those, but the fact is most people are just going to have a shaky cam in their hands. The problem with the Luxies and the reason why it never took off is how many people do you see walking around with Bluetooth headsets even, let alone a great big camera hanging off the side of their face? Um, you know, Until we fix the hardware problem and make live streaming a much, much easier uh, thing to do, then it's it's going to struggle, I think, from a consumer standpoint. It's almost and like we need to incorporate it into some sort of pair of glasses or something. Almost as if, yeah, some sort of pair of glasses. Yeah, absolutely. I, I should imagine that um, <laughs> when they release what's happening with Google Glass version 2, uh, probably October-ish, we might, uh, we might even get something around that. I think what might be interesting there is the kind of GoPro would be the people I would recommend to watch on there. They, they've done so well with... Um, the hardware side of things, it doesn't seem 
that far fetched for them to be the you know the the main innovators there. And whether they'll be a bit like I suppose Fitbit in that they do their one thing very very well and then perhaps struggle to go beyond that in the way that uh, a Fitbit versus an Apple Watch is two very different things. Um, but if you want a fitness tracker, you buy a Fitbit, don't you? So I'd imagine that you know I would imagine GoPro would perhaps be the place I'd be looking for that software to come from because they've got the, the hardware so right. Yeah, and I, th- I think you've, you've um, really nailed it. Uh, GoPro is a very interesting company to watch. Um, they're doing an awful lot of very interesting things. Of course, at uh, I.O. last week, um, they showed the uh, the great big GoPro rig for virtual reality recording. And... Uh, you know, there's the there's the alternative GoPro version of that that uh, Robert Scoble was uh, showing us all on Facebook with the the sort of little bobble of GoPros on the end of a stick. Um, you know, they're definitely moving in all of these very interesting areas and uh, making some really interesting acquisitions in the space to uh, you know around uh, live streaming, around virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, there's some interesting stuff happening at GoPro, so I think it's a pretty good show. But David, what do you think? What do I think? Well, I think um, I'm still in this mode of I want to find out more about it because I don't know um, massively, you know, how Periscope works. Um, I mean, one question in terms of that I've got is simply um, what happens in terms of live broadcast? Is it only available within the Periscope app or is it broadcast as a live tweet as well? The fact that it's actually integrated with Twitter. Yeah, it's, um, so it's, it's broadcast live via the Periscope app. You can watch it via the web at the moment as well, though you don't get the same level of interaction possible. You can't comment and, and hit, hit the hearts either. Um, so you're able to... So it gets shared via Twitter so that external uh, users who aren't necessarily connected with you can find it. Everything gets the, uh, the Periscope hashtag attached to it. And then, of course, on your device as well, you've got the ability at the end of the broadcast to upload it to the... Periscope servers. In fact, as of yesterday's update, that happens instantaneously, and people can play that back for up to 24 hours. You can also save your local broadcast, minus all of the comments and the hearts, to your local device, and therefore use it to upload to YouTube, Vimeo, Wistia, whatever it might be as well. So there's plenty of opportunity to be creating content that, yes, gets broadcast live and streamed, is available for 24 hours on the platform, but is also then available for you to upload to all the traditional recorded video means as well. Mm. It certainly sounds exciting, and um, it's certainly something that I want to use and perhaps actually integrate maybe even to the, into the show at some point. Um, I guess, though, that um, in terms of use, a lot of companies um, have got to be a little bit careful about um, how it's used because they won't maybe have any direct control over how people within their organizations are using it. And um, it's um, probably a communication medium that has to be really informal and engaging and personality driven. And surely there are probably some brands out there that are not going to be using it in the right way. There are going to be broadcasting, and that's going to be an exercise in negative publicity for a few people. It's going to come down to their social media policy, as, as usual, which right. they've been trying to nail for years. Yeah. So, and, you uh, know, and at the end of the day, if you, if you hire influencers, you have to uh, take them as influencers, you know, regardless of whether they influence in the right way or not. If, if, if you're hiring people because of the reach and influence that they have, um, you have to take the rough with the smooth. Um, I, you know, for example, Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> so, Paul, you're sitting quietly in the corner there. Are you a periscoper at all? I'm not a periscoper yet. I did try it on the last conference. Um, my first opinion about this app is that it's even on their website they mentioned that the idea to launch this app it was based on the situation that happens in the Ukraine the last year. So, and I think uh, for this specific app, the impression to be in an emergency situation, um, and we all know that Twitter uh, stream people tweeting at any kind of emergency quite often. So that's probably was the reason why they actually bought uh, this app. But at the same time, the problem with the live streaming is. Me personally, and I think a bunch of the other people, they want to see the content on my own time. So I'm not always will be on the live stream. I mean, it's still pretty good for events. 
sports shows, you know, good keynotes. That's probably great, but in my opinion, I don't think it will replace and be another V blog stuff. That's my personal. Mm, certainly a lot happening. Um, well, I mean, we've covered an awful lot today, so that just about takes us up towards the end of um, this week's show. Um, just time, I reckon, for a, a single takeaway and some sharing of find out more details from our guests. Um, so, starting off with Kelvin. Sorry, I, I misheard the question there. Sorry, that's the thing. So just um, how, how would you summarise um, maybe the key takeaway um, for our listeners and viewers mm-hmm. and um, just what's your, your contact details if people would like to find out more about you? Yeah, so if anyone wants to find me, um, probably the easiest place is on um, Twitter, where my username is Kelvin Newman, all one word. Um, I think probably the the key lesson I've got from today is that there's always going to be new things launched. It's always worth having an experiment. But as we've seen with the, the folding in um, that Yahoo have done, is that there's always a danger that these products can be discontinued. So I think it's a kind of experiment but uh, understand that there's risks, i.e. the platform that you might build within that might be dependent on the whims of that larger company, which I think would be appropriate for a lot of these new technologies we've been talking about as well. Okay, so find out about how the technology works, but don't necessarily feel you have to jump on it and embrace it and spend a lot of time on it just now. Yeah, and don't build your business on someone else's platform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Matt, um, what, what would your key takeaway be here and um, also some contact details for you as well? Sure. I'm, I'm going to stick with the Periscope theme and urge people just to, to try it out, see, uh, see what they think of it. Yes, tune in to other people's broadcasts, but uh, do a bit of research as to who to follow first because uh, there's a lot of rubbish there. Um, there's also some less salubrious uh, broadcasters, but uh, you can find some real gems. There are some um, some real players out there making names for themselves on the right uh, on the right footing. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, again, uh, Twitter. I'm part of the underscore brigade, so Matt underscore Hodkinson. You can reach me there. And Paul. Yeah, so my Twitter is Paul Rizano, the same one more. And uh, from this uh, conversation, it was quite interesting for me to know about the Yahoo stuff shutting down so many different things. This was definitely uh, the new new stuff for me. And the takeaway for other people, I would say there are a bunch of other things happens every single week. And just keep looking and see what the new technology brings to you and how you can use that for your own brand. And uh, to the man who ran through the streets of Tunbridge to uh, make it here on time, uh, Stuart. Uh, Well, I've learned that public transport isn't necessarily as uh, good as we would like to think it is. Um, So that's the first thing I learned, uh, because it nearly made me very late. Um, But, uh, you know, I think... um, you know, to reflect what everyone else has said in terms of, you know, trying something. I mean, that's really the journey of marketing, isn't it? Um, don't we, as marketers, try something, see if it works. If it works, we keep doing it. If it doesn't work, we throw it away and try something else. I mean, that's effectively conversion rate optimization. And, you know, whilst it uh, whilst it isn't conversion rate optimization in the sense of, you know, putting something like Optimizely in and, and uh, playing around with your website uh, to see what changes uh, improve things. It still is conversion rate optimization in the end. Um, I remember back in the very early days of my sales career, uh, optimizing what I was saying to people, and uh, it was a very subtle change. The script said, "Say, who is the best person to talk to regarding this?" And I changed it to, "Who other than yourself is the best person to talk to about this?" And that small psychological change gave me around about a 400% increase in sales. And uh, that's conversion rate optimization. Nothing has changed since those days, back when I had naturally brown hair, and nothing will probably change for another 200 years. And how do the uh, the viewers get in touch with you if they'd like to find out more? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the real SJR. That's the real SJR, just in case there's a fake SJR out there. Yeah. Um, or just type my name spelled properly. That's S T E W A R T, and Rogers is R O G E R S into Google. And uh, you'll find me in the top sort of eight or nine of the ten results. Uh, Don't put me in Bing because they don't like me that much. 
Wonderful. Okay. Well, I'm David Bain, head of growth here at uh, analyticsseo.com, and you can also catch me interviewing online marketing gurus over at digitalmarketingradio.com. Now, if you're watching this as a recording, uh, remember to watch the next episode live. Head over to thisweekinorganic.com and sign up to watch the next show in real time. Um, there was perhaps a little bit of a challenge with the the live stream today. Hopefully, some of you caught it live. So, if so, thanks for participating. And um, remember to continue sharing your thoughts using the hashtag Twio on Twitter. So that's just the four letters. T-W-I-O. So until next time, have a fantabulous weekend and thank you all for joining us. Adios. Cheers everyone. Thanks for being part of it. Thank you. See you. Thank you.